You guys out there, take a good look at your girl. Did you ever say, I never get tired of looking at your face? I never get tired of looking at your face. I close my eyes and dream I see you in every place The light heaviness of the feel of your head Watching the bounce of your curls in midair When you tumble in bed next to me The sneak preview of your ear peeking through pulls me close to you, caressing your silky strands of hair for a better view. My fingers glide over smooth temple, then on to a delicate fluttering lashes so what can I do I never get tired of the feel of your head the bounce of your curls when you tumble in bed I can't wait till tomorrow to say you look better to me every day I never get tired of looking at, at your face I love you I love you As you heard in the introduction of that song, I never get tired of looking at your face. Um, I happened to be sitting on the couch with my wife at that time, and I looked over and said to her, I never get tired, you know, you know I never get tired of looking at your face. Then I went over to, to the piano and composed that song, and I hope that uh, sat well with you all. It is true that sometimes we do become a little compulsive about our behavior and things that are important to us, whether it's real or imagined. Uh, this next story also takes place in uh, Montpellier, France, where I went to school, and it was an area called the Long Doc, which means the tongue of yes, as opposed to Long Dui, which is, uh, means also the tongue of yes, but that was from the northern part of France, from Lille, for example. But in the southern part, in the Provence, they called it Languedoc because that's the way they said yes there, aussi. Whereas up north it was O-I-E, which meant yes. Also, historically, it was very interesting because the Romans built a lot of, uh, uh, had a lot of cities there and a lot of their artwork was there. And there is one famous uh, aqueduct, uh, that uh, has stood by and has been present all these years. As I mentioned, things can be compelling to people and we become somewhat obsessed with them. I have a couple stories here that I want to tell you about obsessive compulsive uh, disorders. I had one 35-year-old year, uh, Frenchman that came into my office. Uh, in the clinic, in the clinic RECH, or ECH, which, which was associated with the Faculty of Medicine and the Neurosurgery, Neurosurgery Department in Montpellier, uh, France. Uh, Professor Claude Gros was my, uh, pa my patron and a, a very famous neurosurgeon from the Mediterranean Basin. Anyway, this uh, man came in and I went to greet him to shake his hand. Well, he looked at me hesitantly, looked at my hand, and he wouldn't shake my hand. And I, we were speaking French, and I said, why won't you shake my hand? He said, pour que vous êtes sale, because you are dirty. I said, well, wait a minute. I am a surgeon, and I wash my hands a number of times during the day. He said, that's not good enough, you're still dirty. So I said, well, okay. Um, um, 
can you want to take off your clothes and put them in the closet there and then go wash up in the bathroom and he continued on I can't use that uh, closet it's not my closet I can't use that bathroom it's not my bathroom because it's all dirty and then suddenly in the midst of all this verbal jostling back and forth <clears throat> We both noticed a fly that was soaring around the room, bouncing against the ceiling and the walls um, with, its, uh, with its buzzing sound. And I noticed that the patient's eyes would be attentively darting up and down and following the flight. And then sure enough, the fly does a tailspin and lands right on his wrist. So I couldn't resist the moment and I said, not being too sarcastic, but I said in French, I guess that bothers you very much. With that, he did break down crying and said to me in such a sad voice, I am a sorry man. I am a sorry poor man. I am a sorry poor man. So at this point then, we did uh, take him to surgery. In those days, in, in that part of the evolution of neurosurgery, frontal lobotomies were current. In other words, we were doing it for a number of different problems and particularly for obsessive compulsive disorders. Now, as I mentioned, this man had a very serious disorder that went on for about 12 years or so when he not, had not only not even looked at or touched either his wife or his two daughters. Um, so he was intractable to all the different types of medications, to lecture shock therapy, to psychiatry, to psychotherapy, etc., and thus we decided to proceed with the uh, with the surgery. This surgery was done under actually local anesthetic through two small burr holes placed over the head, over the prefrontal zone, and then we would uh, pass something called a leucotone, which was a kind of like a butter knife in a way, and do a couple of small cuts across the connections that went from the prefrontal brain back to the deeper structures into the thalamus. Anyway, this could change your behavior dramatically. At that particular clinic, it was mainly run by a group of dedicated Spanish nuns who were there 24 hours a day. And they did every operation with us and you always knew which uh, nun nurses were gonna be there. And they knew all the procedures that we did. So actually, during the operation, you could pretty much just stick out your hand and the right instrument would be laid there. Well, we went ahead and did the operation and then the nurse, uh, this one sister Maria particularly, explained to me that you're gonna witness the most bizarre emotional behavior that you've ever seen. And nobody was allowed to go near him except the nurses to uh, feed him. So for two weeks, he was really locked in his uh, hospital room. And it was animalistic, the type of behavior that you would see with the just uninhibited, uncontrolled, uh, bizarre uh, behavior, screaming, yelling, throwing himself against the wall, uh, throwing feces, one thing after another. It was really pretty, pretty impressive. Well, and then after two weeks, sure enough, the behavior kind of just ceased just like she told me it would. In that particular hospital, the first floor hospital rooms were situated around the courtyard. And there are these French doors that open to the courtyard. In the middle of the courtyard, there was a great big oak tree that was surrounded by a white bench. And when we opened the door to let him go out for the first time, his wife and his two daughters were sitting on the bench around this tree. Well, he very meekly and quietly and tentatively walked out into the courtyard, went up to the bench and with his head bowed and then he lifted it with a smile. And it really was one of the most poignant moments that I've witnessed in my neurosurgical career that he actually went down and hugged and kissed his wife and his two daughters and they just a hug for what appeared to be such a long time and it was a beautiful moment that's forever imprinted in my in my head.